welcome back to episode two of the thinking cap welcome everybody we're so happy to have you amanda hoprich and beck moore co-hosts now we just get to add that to our co-hosts i know it's wild to see my name in the podcast list right i was like oh not something i ever really expected for myself but happy to be in this space and thank you to all of you who took the time to listen to our last episode we did get some feedback was a little long we hear you but also we got some really great ratings which is exciting yeah i can't believe i mean we can't believe people are listening we appreciate that right we hope you find this as a new resource from cap of just what's going on and uh taking us along with you in your car in the office wherever you are yeah so we're going to start with our cap updates and holy smokes we have a lot of cap updates since the last time we came together we have been all over the place i know and, we traveled all over the country yeah it's pretty crazy so when you get our out of office messages um it's it's been real uh we started out in new orleans yeah we were at the the rise conference on social determinants of health we wanted to show a part of that conference we've been attending. I know I've been attending for the last few years since I started here at CAP. And one of the things that we we hear all the time, right, is nonprofits get some get some shade about the idea that we're not technologically advanced or that maybe we don't understand outcomes or we don't have capacity. And that's the one thing we wanted to make sure people understood, right, is that, look, we're not every other nonprofit. We're not every other CBO. Here at Community Action, we know social determinants of health. We know outcomes, we know technology, and we're going to build a system to make sure that we can do whatever we need to do. And we know that when we work closely with healthcare, we can make really amazing things happen and help people in really dynamic ways. And so we wanted to show a part of that conference. We were a sponsor. We have a really great partnership with that with that group and brought some of our, our agencies. We also launched our case study that ClearLink Partners helped us to create. And we're going to be talking to them hopefully here in a little bit later on in the show. And that that case study really showcases the fact that you know our agencies have been being been doing this work dynamically for a long time and happy to be able to showcase just the remarkable things that are happening across the state within community action and we partnered with national community action partnership ship for that yeah. sponsorship that's a little bit of a yeah. tongue tie <laughs> um so we were there with ncap which was exciting because it really just shed a light not only on pennsylvania and all the amazing things that we're fortunate enough to raise up for our innovative members and you know such a shout out um but really nationally and it was a very unique partnership i don't think people have ever seen a cbo show up as a sponsor right. to a healthcare conference like that on social determinants of health so it's true uh yeah shout out removed. to De shout out to denise harlow sorry i mean to step on you there amanda but yeah mm -hmm. shout out to denise harlow the um, national ceo of the national community action partnership she saw the additive value in this we'd all been attending for a few years and so when the opportunity came to potentially co-sponsor that event it was sort of right. Yes, absolutely. That's going to, you know, put us in a place that people are going to recognize who we are and hopefully get some better brand recognition. So we were happy to show up there together, be able to talk to a lot of people, show that that case study and hopefully get a little recognition. So thanks to thanks to Denise and the national office for for partnering with us on that. Yeah. And we hosted an event. We did. We had a great DEI summit, which really quickly came and went and remarkable group of people that that showed up who are really committed to this work. And one of the things that I love about that event is it's it's not sort of the traditional DEI learning that we all have in our offices, right? About, okay, you know, we're learning that we're biased and what do we do with that bias and what is DEI? Some of that, yes, some of that was there, but also some of the pieces about how to make a really inclusive workplace culture and creating some really great outcomes from a workplace perspective that lead to recruitment and retention. You know, some of the things we talked about on our last show, if you haven't yep. listened yet, shameless plug there. And I will also say that shout out to our team who just did a remarkable job. Amanda was traveling. She got stuck in Alabama. And so she unfortunately couldn't be there. And the great thing about the way our team showed up is they really represented who we are from a workplace culture perspective, right? Yes. The person who was responsible for the event couldn't be there. And her team was still able to execute really phenomenally and just do a great job. So shout out to the team, shout out to Amanda for the way that she managed the event. You did a great job. It was a 
lovely Thankfully, time. It was our first hybrid event, so I could still attend virtually. And sure. um, yeah, was on the phone with the team doing some virtual behind the scenes, which we learned continuous improvement in our workplace culture that we didn't think we needed someone virtual only. And we will definitely always have someone virtual only because it became um, hectic at times, but we're glad we got so much feedback. We learned so much. And if you haven't checked out, we have launched six new DEI courses in CapLearn. And some of those experts that helped instruct those courses were featured at our summit. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, we had, they were some of the best responses of some of the, the, the um, speakers that day at the event, really high ratings to some of our folks, honestly, all of our folks, they all got really high ratings about this event. And we were so happy to have them there and see some of the people that I'm lucky enough to call friends. And so thank you to those of you who are a part of our DEI educator groups to, to come out and, and be a part of that day. And I also just want to say shout out to our keynote, Clint Smith, who great author, poet. He is a phenomenal speaker. The way that he's able to really make you feel truly, truly his words coming to life on page and some of the experiences that he had in writing um, how, how the word is passed, which was the, the book that was really featured at this event. I just can't say enough good about Clint. He's he's an uh, amazing author. And so if you haven't read the book, please read it, read it, listen to his TED talk. Um, he's he's all over the place. He's a writer for The Atlantic. Just can't say enough good about Clint. So we're really appreciative of him coming and helping to educate the group as well. And, and, and Clint also got to say, you're listening. if you're listening, I mean, I it stands. I said, I joked about this at the event. I want to be your bestie, Clint. I think, you know, let's let's get together, man. Next time you're in town. I'll come We've to been through a curveball at him from our standpoint, like a few days before we were like, can you stay and sign books? And he did. And sure. for those that attended in person, I hope you got your copy, which you should have received in your swag bag signed by Clint. And so just one of the you know, cool highlights of that event it was a really Absolutely. great event. If you are a CAP member, the recorded sessions are available on Cap Learn. So even if you had to miss that event, uh, check it out on Cap Learn. Everything is live. And man, that's then we were we were all kind of all over the place. And we have a big event coming up. We want to make sure folks have on their radar and calendars. It's true. The Cap Conference quickly approaching in October. Going to be in Lancaster again this year, October twenty second for pre conference, and then the twenty third and the twenty fourth for the larger kind of portion of the event. And so we want to make sure people know about that. Remember, if it's if you're a board member of Community Action Agency, if you're an executive leader, if you're a middle manager, if you're frontline staff, it doesn't matter who you are. We want you to be able to come and really learn from one another. It's it's really meant and designed to be for everyone to lift up best practices. And to that end, we do have on our website, the caap.org our RFP for proposals. So if you have a best practice you want to showcase, if you're a consultant, if you're an educator on any particular topic they feel is really rele relevant to our agencies or the work that we do, please fill out that proposal. We, we're we looking for good speakers to come and help to educate our, our network. So please, please take advantage of that. And shameless plug, if you are interested in helping to support CAP in our podcast, for instance, The Thinking CAP, or to support our work in our conference or other programmatic pieces that we do. There's also that call for sponsorship on our website. So please take a look and think about supporting either this podcast or some of the other things that we're doing. We appreciate the help that we get to do all of the great things we are able to do for our members that are very appreciative of being able to come to a one-stop shop for training and technical assistance whenever possible. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we love about our sponsors is we also love to just give as much care to this network. I mean, it is all of your all's work that we have the privilege of lifting up and attending things like Rise or making this podcast so people are aware of it. And uh, we love to have you come out to the conference and be able to give back a little bit and appreciate yeah. the support that we get in being able to do that. Yeah, and just if you're thinking about coming to the conference, 
it's a great time. There's a lot of learning that happens. We also, we make sure our members feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated, just like our own workplace culture statements, right? Same thing goes for our members. So we have a good time. We try to give you all some really great food. We have a great event one of the nights to lift up. Our smoked. second annual Captivating Awards Ceremony. It's true. So I think along those lines, pay attention if you're a CAP member to our awards nomination form that's going to be launched. If you have It'll a be coming really, out in July. Yeah. If you have a really amazing staff member that you want to nominate for something that they've done, please take advantage of that. We want to make sure to, to lift up what's happening. And you all know about it, right? We don't we don't always get to hear about it. And so it's a an opportunity to to showcase that that staff member who's maybe done something really fantastic or has been around for a really long time and just has never really had the opportunity to be recognized for something. Yeah. We just closed out our community action month was in May with our DEI summit and we had our faces of action campaign, which was just so much fun. I love that campaign. It's my favorite campaign of the year to celebrate community action month. We, for those that don't know what faces of action is, we ask similar to our captivating awards, why you work at community action. And we love to be able to you know, give out some prize packs to really give appreciation back to staff of our member agencies. And if you want to see that campaign, you can go to our Facebook, look us up. We try to post those on a regular basis all through the month of May. And you can see some of the amazing people that work within Community Action, some really just selfless, humble individuals that are doing a lot of just really amazing great work. Great work. I know it's it yeah. warms my heart. It's part of why I say all the time, I feel really blessed to be a part of this network. Let's get some great people. Yeah. So before we jump into our special guests, um, we want to remind everyone who's listening, we want your questions from the community. So if you have anything you want to ask Beck or I or an upcoming guest speaker, we encourage you to email us at info at thecap.org. So our huggy heart of the matter today is going to be all around social determinants of health or SDOH. And we're very excited. We're going to be having our first special expert guest speaker. Yeah, I'm excited to have her. She's I had the great opportunity actually at a RISE conference to get to meet her. And I heard a little bit about her story and her work formerly within Community Action. And so happy to have her be a part of this, this podcast. So I'm so excited to be able to introduce this next guest, our very first official podcast guest. Thank you, Karin, for being our guinea pig in this and being our first our first guest. But I had the great privilege of being able to meet Karin at a RISE conference on social determinants of health. What I loved about her was her story and her authenticity and what she shared about how she found herself working in the healthcare space. And so thank you to Karin Van Zandt for being here today. Karin, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit. So happy to be here. Um, I felt like I found some kindred folks when I met um, the CAP staff. Um, uh, so my name is Karin Van Zandt. I have lived in the same county, uh, Clark County, Ohio, my entire life, and I turned 50 this year. Um, I married birthday. my high school boyfriend. Um, that man, pray for him. He has hung out with me for almost 30 years married, but 34 years total. And, he sounds like a lucky um, guy. That's a future podcast a about very how. very lucky guy. <laughs> future Most podcast days. topic. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But, um, and, and the reason I share a little bit of that background is that um, I was a junior in college, um, a pre-med med, pre -med major, interning with orthopedic surgeons and working as an athletic trainer for the college when um, I found myself pregnant and uninsured and ended up on Medicaid. And that year um, literally redefined my entire life. Um, and um, while it was very difficult to go through in that year, um, it gave me lots and lots of blessings um, over and over. One being a, I have a 29 year old son who is a civil engineer and is doing amazing things. Um, it really gave Nate and I, my husband and I, an opportunity to figure out life way quicker than a lot of people do. Um, and, um, and decide that we were going to keep choosing each other no matter how hard life got. Um, and it landed me um, in a position of working with social services because 
what I experienced in the American safety net through Medicaid and food stamps and cash assistance was not what was really being taught in the mid 90s to social workers, definitely not being taught in the pre-med program. Um, and I really felt like um, a lot of advocacy needed to be done. Um, the one thing I will say though, is my very first job out of college was at our local community action agency here in Clark County, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, I have deep, deep roots, um, but I was not a good social worker. Um, a lot of the programs did not make sense to me. I broke a lot of rules. I had five different positions in that community action agency in five years because I'm really sure that the executive director thought that I was gonna end their funding. Um, and then I went to work for the Ohio Association for Community Action for a few years, um, trying to do policy work. Um, and I have a deep, deep love for the work that community action agencies are doing. I always have, I've always tried to figure out how to pull whichever local agency, no matter where I was at, um, working um, into the fold because I think you guys are literally doing God's work. Um, I think that you are the hands and feet that are out there working um, with the most vulnerable populations um, in our country. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your just your story, your authenticity, and for sharing a little bit about, you know, what you've what you've what you've gone through. I think, you know, your story really speaks to the 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 challenges, right? Exactly some of the the whole person approach that our agencies take and the the challenges of trying to navigate a system not only as an individual trying to receive services, but also as a social worker, right? There's no easy way to help people understand right. this system. And as somebody who's relatively new to the world of community action, I I so appreciate that because I still feel like I'm sitting in rooms two years and seven months later and I'm like, I don't understand this acronym or how to get access to this. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you for sharing a little bit about, about yourself and thank you for joining us again. We appreciate you being here. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about this work and I'll answer questions about um, this topic um, all day, every day, um, because I don't think that there can be enough um, education or advocacy about um, the social conditions in almost every single community across the country. With that, Beck, can you talk a little bit about some of the unrecognized work in community action around social determinants of health in this space? Absolutely. And I and I will say that, you know, Karin is, is someone that helped me to really have this appreciation going to our going to the social determinants of health conference, you know, immediately I knew that when I first started here at CAP, we were we had a challenge of trying to pe help people understand the story of who we were. Just a lot of people are not familiar with community action on the whole. And as soon as I started to better understand the idea of social determinants of health, I immediately realized, right, like this is an opportunity to help people understand who we are and what we do. And so Karin was very helpful in, help, in helping me understand this. But I think right when we think about how to make a whole family, an individual, really healthy, right, truly, truly, right, like live the best version of their lives that they they can we know that people are are born into their bodies right and there's genetic code and then there's our zip code and so our zip code also translates to our health and our our health outcomes and so part of what community action does right is to consider what is happening on a localized level through community needs assessments and then make sure that the resources are there so that there really is this right localized network of comprehensive care and then the partnership that exists within community action and healthcare creates these opportunities, right, to help people have all of the resources that they need from a healthcare perspective, from a local related, you know, health health related social needs perspective. And so I'm going to ask Karin the question then of, can you tell a little bit, explain a little bit to people about really truly what social determinants of health is? Because we've talked a little bit about it. I've talked a little bit about the work within community action and some of the translation of it, but I think you can really help people understand really truly, right, what social determinants of health are. Yeah, and um, and I'll say there's a lot of definitions out there, um, and there is even some confusion around um, the definitions, but I kind of always go back to a source, right? And so the Healthy People 2030 now, it was 2010, 2020, and now 2030, um, has had a consistent definition for social determinants of health since I got into um, uh, the game um, 15 years ago. And so they're the conditions and the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. Um, and they have a, a direct effect on your overall health. 
um, the, the way that we function in our communities or don't, um, and the quality of our life. And what I will say is, I think one of the confusing points about social determinants of health is that there are some people that think that only poor people or minority people have social determinants of health, but y'all, we all have them. Like right. Absolutely. housing affects all of us. Uh, transportation affects all of us. Now, the degree to which my housing crisis or transportation crisis may be different from somebody else's housing or transportation crisis, absolutely, there are variations across how um, a person who has resources or is from the dominant culture may experience social determinants of health um, or may have fewer of them, but we all have them, right? Right. Like um, one of the statistics that I you know, recently heard was about, and it's it's not, you know, we think about it after you hear the statistics, you're like, well, yeah, of course, you know, somebody who is housing insecure is, I think it's 50 or 60% more likely to not show up to a follow-up appointment from a doctor's, from a doctor's appointment. Well, of course, right. If I don't even know potentially where I'm going to live, my likelihood of going to get a follow-up after, you know, an EKG or blood work or whatever, of course, is far less likely. And then you add on, right. Zip code components of transportation, access to get there, et cetera, right. All of those things start to compound to more and more issues and how that impacts somebody's somebody's health. Well, and I'll build off of that, like just the reminder systems that most providers have built into their workflows, right? So I'm sure many of you all, if you have a dentist appointment, sometime about a month before your dentist appointment, you're going to get a text message or an email or a phone call from your dentist. And then like 10 days before, you're going to get another reminder. And then like the day before, they're going to ask you if you need to reschedule or if you're really going to be there. Why are they doing all that? Because it affects their bottom line when you don't show. Right? Of course. right. Um, but also, I can tell you, I have become so dependent on those reminder systems that it's not always in my calendar that I have a dentist appointment, right? Because I know I've got to set that up six months ahead of time, which who knows? I mean, I'm a pretty planful and scheduled person. I have no idea what my life is going to look like six months from now to set a dentist appointment up. And so we've become dependent on those reminder systems, but my life is very stable, right? I live in the same place. I've had the same cell phone number for like 15 years. Um, I don't know what would happen if I lost my cell phone number, right? I, I would lose half my brain. And so when I think about the, um, the lack of stability that other folks may have, the system is not set up to be that nimble, that flexible, and take into consideration what is the hottest burning fire for them today uh, might not be the dentist appointment we scheduled six months ago, right? And so I think that as social determinants of health have become more important in the conversation from a healthcare perspective, there's this recognition that I want to be compliant in my healthcare but I may not have all of the resources or bandwidth um, at my disposal to fit a model that requires me to make an appointment six months in ahead for preventative reasons, because I might have other pressing priorities um, that are going on that day with the limited amount of resources that I have. Right. I mean, if, if I'm an, an employee of, of a, 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 an employer that I don't have PTO, right. right? I can't take time off. My kid gets sick. I need to get them to an appointment and there is no other choice, I may lose my employment, right? right? So I'm literally, and we talk about this a lot when we talk about poverty and community action, right? We're one emergency away, healthcare related or otherwise, from being right back into a situation that you may have overcome, right? That you may have gotten out of, but that one emergency has immediately put me back in a trajectory of having to dig back out. I'm going to go a little bit off script here and ask this question. You know how, I know how you love for me to do this, but I think it's a really important concept to to ask right a lot of times in within our network we've talked about the idea of social determinants of health and this partnership opportunity with healthcare is it just a trend right is it just something that's social determinants of health it's another buzz phrase right is it really here to stay and so can you react to that because i think it's an Im Im important thing for people to hear directly from somebody who i really truly believe is an expert in this space like it or not, Karin, that's that's the way you are viewed. You are, own it, love it. But can you react to that a little bit for us? Yeah. Gosh, I hope not. I mean, I think there are still those in the healthcare space that would like to see it just be a fad um, because it's hard. It is really hard work. 
it is much easier to imagine prescribe. that. Imagine that it's equity, hard. E yeah. equity is equity is hard to achieve. Is that what you're saying? That's equity is hard. Um, health outcomes, quality of life, those things are hard. Um, and and even if we weren't looking at those types of long term, you know, multi year types of goals, finding housing today is much harder than writing a script for insulin. Right? It's right. just hard because. We have not invested as a country in housing stock at any level um, for decades. And so if if we know that the person coming in the emergency room or the emergency department the 57th time this year, and it's only June, is coming because they're homeless and they have behavioral health issues and they don't actually have an urgent ER type of need but this is the place where they can get some level of care and maybe a meal. And this is the place they know to come to or transportation into town from an ambulance. Um, we all know that person needs housing, but housing's hard. Right. Um, and for the, I mean, that's one of the things in working with you all this last year, like the number of innovations that are happening in the state of Pennsylvania through community action agencies, through not just homelessness, and I don't want to say just homelessness solutions, because that's truly, truly important, but how your executives and staff have built off of the homelessness solutions to find medical respite places, to find long-term um, uh, apartment um, units for people with severe mental illness, um, to work with the recovery population or people coming out of prison who don't I mean, people coming out of prison don't actually have access to any subsidized housing because of their felony conviction a lot right. of times. And so finding solutions for those individuals. Um, and I'm just, it was just really um, not necessarily amazed, but just really proud um, of the work that's happening across the state of Pennsylvania, um, across the SDOH, spe uh, SDOH spectrum, right? Um, and at the same time, how large hospital systems, the health plans that you have in your state um, and, and the providers can start to leverage those homegrown solutions to reduce costs, to get the appropriate care. Because the appropriate care for that person that's coming to the ER for the 56th time this year is not emergency department services. Right. Um, the appropriate care is case coordination, case management, housing. Um, and, and that all happens at the very individual, very localized place. And so I hope this isn't a fad. Um, you know, I've been, I started working with uh, a in, uh, Medicaid insurance company back in 2009. And so, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a minute that we, that I've been working on the SDOH stuff inside of healthcare. And at ClearLink, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of stakeholders across the country. Um, and so, you know, seeing how state Medicaid departments are really leveraging um, waiver authorities, how they're really getting innovative with the duals or the, the, um, the duals population, those that are both Medicaid and Medicare eligible, um, all of that includes community supports um, and healthcare is not good at community supports, right? And so um, I think that is this new momentum that we've all been experiencing since the pandemic is the pandemic could be very much seen as a medical crisis, but really where the crisis happened was not just in a hospital system. Right. Well, and the solutions, the true solutions, right? How vaccinations were able to be pushed out, right? How people were right. helped in finding services when they were in crisis because of COVID, right? That all happened on a really localized level. You know, it was the local community action agency who was able to connect with people who they were already clients of community action, right? Who healthcare couldn't get a hold of and community action was seeing on an everyday basis. Right. That's really, right, that localized high touch network of care that ends up happening within these partnership opportunities. And to that point back, you know, I've gotten to work with from the biggest managed care companies like the United Healths and the, the Centines and, you know, the Anthems to some of the very, very small 
quasi-public um, health plans, they all want a high touch response. They do. Right. They Absolutely. And they all completely understand you cannot manage care of a person who's not engaged. Like they totally get that, right? right. They're spending millions and millions of dollars to figure out how to get people engaged, how to have correct information on them, how to get them to open the postcard or the letter that's coming to the mailbox um, or answer the call. Like they know that. And so I think that the more we do figure out the ecosystem at the local level and the right configuration of social care, behavioral health care, and physical care, the better the outcome is going to be. Because I really, Absolutely. truly believe, and I, I think insurance sometimes gets a bad rap for a variety of reasons, but they truly do want people to get the right level of services at the right time and have better health outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that comment is so timely. I was just happened to be yesterday at the Pennsylvania Association of Managed Care Organizations board meeting. Shout out to Emily Katz, who invited me to be able to attend to talk about community action on the whole. And it was a really remarkable conversation about what's happening within community action. And they asked very thoughtful questions about, you know, what are you doing as, as a network about maternal health, right? We know that this these are some of the challenges that we are seeing. Is there opportunity right there? And we know through the, the diaper grant that we received from OCS this past year, the very high percentage of women, particularly, or those who identify as women that are living in poverty or just right, just above the federal poverty line who don't have access to prenatal care. And yeah. our agencies are providing that type of service. You know, there's just, there's some, again, remarkable localized solutions that are happening. And I don't want to, I mean, I know you have other questions for us. So I know, Karen, I could talk well, to you all day. Listen, I love when you guys go off script, and this is exactly uh, what we were hoping to intend. But uh, one thing I want both of your comment on, but I'll ask Beck first. So when you're asked these questions, and you know, a lot of our agency folks are asked these questions, and we have developed some resources with our partnership with ClearLink that are now available. We talked about it a little bit in our uh, CAP updates. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the resources now that CAP has made available for our member agencies and for any healthcare partnerships to kind of speak to these things? Um, and Karen, for you to just jump in. On, we're going off script again, folks. Just jump in on um, what we've really accomplished through that. And you, you guys have kind of talked about it a little bit already. So, that. so I'll I'll share two things, and then Karen, if you want to kind of dig into them to help people mm -hmm. understand what's available. So the first was our value proposition case study, right for the translation of why healthcare should be working with community action. And then the second is a training that I know that you have been dedicated this year to to creating for our, our frontline folks. Can you give a little bit more about what to expect from both of those, which you can find the, the value proposition is available on our homepage of our website, or I'm sorry, on the about section of our website. So the cap.org slash about, and then our training will be launched sometime this summer. Um, and that will be available in CapLearn, our learning management system. Yeah, so, um, you know, working on the value proposition um, and having a background in community action, um, you know, really, uh, it really brought kind of the last 20 years of my career together, um, you know, 10 years of working inside managed care. Prior to that, you know, 10, 15 years of working for community action agencies and 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 community development types of organizations. Um and really kind of the vision for the value proposition was to be used to talk to multiple stakeholder groups, right? Is um, I know that in Ohio, some, sometimes we would say, if you've seen one community action agency, you've seen one community action agency. And also we would say, and sometimes we're the best kept secrets. And I kept kind of hearing that um, throughout the time that I worked with you and your, your member agencies. Um, and yet, this is a time to not be shy, right? Like this is a time where you've got to be really bold and um, and you've got to get your message out there because um, this innovative or disruptive time of kind of bringing the walls down between the silos and the sectors of federal and state funding is not going to be with us for long. Right. Um, and those that are bold and step out and say, hey, wait a minute, Medicaid or CMS, we've been around doing this work for 65 years and at the local level, we are an affiliated network and we are a key partner to what you all are writing into waiver programs and trying to develop new funding sources for. 
don't medicalize our work, but fold into the work that we've been providing and provide us some sustainable funding streams um, to emphasize our work. And so you talked uh, just briefly, I wanna highlight the maternal health programming um, that is a part of the value proposition. And I had such great interviews with some of your members and the, the directors and the, the workers that are doing the maternal health. But this is a key example from an executive level of the types of contracting that every one of the community action agencies in Pennsylvania and across the country should have in place. You all have been working with pregnant women at the local level for 65 years. Right, yes. Amen this is that. not a new thing that, right. oh, pregnant women, minority pregnant women and poor minority pregnant women probably need help in their community, right? Um, I was a college student, um, not minority and not really poor, but needed help from the Medicaid program and ended up getting a lot of help during my pregnancy because pregnancy in general is hard. It's even harder when it's unplanned and when it's uncertain and when you're a college student or when you're on your own, right? And so thinking through the value-based contracts that a handful of your community action agencies have with the health plans. So this is health plans that are doing contracts with your community action agencies to say, hey, we recognize you have better engagement with pregnant women in your community than we do. Like they show up at your front door for programming. Maybe you should be the trusted messengers. Maybe you should be the trusted entity to help. And maybe we should be a payer. We should pay you to do this service. Right. And we'll figure out the bi-directional data feed, which is what PA Navigate is supposed to be working on. And what you all have, uh, have a great big role in helping them to figure out now is how do we get the good stuff that you guys have been doing for 65 years with right. pregnant women into the right places so that we can not only financially support it, but we can count it as a part of the trajectory to health outcomes um, for um, minority and lower income women that are on the Medicaid plan. Well, and I want to underscore something that you just just said there, because a lot of times when we talk, when we have this conversation about social de social determinants of health work within community action, right? The initial reaction, if if somebody hasn't heard that phrasing, or hasn't hasn't become as educated about this topic as what you know, I'd like to think the three of us are. It's like, oh, well, it's another program. We don't have space for another program. No, no. This is what you were already, already doing. doing. This is already programming. It's just taking what you're doing and translating it to healthcare, right? Or translating for yourself, maybe. But this is already within the scope of what you're doing. And those and just people, letting healthcare know that you're doing it. Right. Sometimes it's yes. just letting them know that you've already done it. Like so I've done I, it well for a long time. Absolutely. And one thing I will say, like even I, who am a champion for community action, as um, I was working with Amanda and with Georgia and rolling up all the data and crunching all of the data, I just bet you all collectively don't really know what you're already doing that the healthcare system needs at scale. Like, so scale is another big part of the conundrum. I, I feel like right now across the country, SDOH's biggest threat is death by a million pilots, yeah. right? Is if we cannot figure out scale, which is this whole new movement in the last year around these community care hubs, of which community action has been a community care hub for 60, 65 years in any local community. Um, because you already have partners with other social service organizations and you're already doing aggregate data and you already are blending and braiding funding. Like all of these things are not new to you all, although they're being talked about as new things that are out there. You serve the half a million Medicaid eligible people. And I feel like that's underreported because you probably served, that's just the adult or child walking through your door. That's not the 4.5 other people that are living on average in the household from the one person who got service. Right. Right. Well, and on and a so, national scale, imagine on a national scale. I know. Works, yes. Right? Yes. If we aggregated the thousand community action agencies impact, I mean, we've got about 80 million people that are on the Medicaid program nationally after this redetermination fallout. And I bet that you're seeing at least 70 to 80% of those people coming through the doors of a community action agency, right? 
And without really being purposeful about screening all of what the healthcare system would want you to screen, you had 28,000 pregnant women that you served in the state of Pennsylvania. But that's also underreported because those were only the women that were in a quote unquote maternal health program. But every food program you run, if it's not designated for seniors, is a maternal health program. Every Head Start is a maternal health program, right? right? And so yes. that's just 28,000 women that were actually enrolled in a designated maternal health program. That's not the women that could have been in another type of program right. that didn't get a box checked somewhere else, but got services, right? And well, so the big opportunity here is to start thinking about what is important to the healthcare sector and what data do they lack? and how to start capturing that data collectively across the 43 community action agencies so that you've got it to be able to roll up because every data point, I mean, you've got great scale. This is bigger scale than what any of the health plans have seen from other types of affiliate organizations. And, and part of it is you've had to do it for your CSBG reporting. I know everybody like rolls their eyes anytime <laughs> we talk about that, but it's important stuff, right? Because if you can't prove you've already done it, then there's a much bigger risk to getting to do it in the future with a new partner, especially a large partner like healthcare. So well, I'm going to, I want to say one other thing. And then I promise. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll and then I'm bringing on. it back to script for, okay. for y'all. Cause that was great, but go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say one other thing. And I think to your, to your other point here, right. Karin about the, 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 what's important to healthcare. It's not only then the maternal health piece It's now the child's been born. We also have the follow-up programs to making sure that Preach. that child has care. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Right. So it's parents as teachers program, it's Head Start, it's access to whatever you want to say, but also a huge gap from healthcare side, right? Yeah. About postpartum. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. What happens in that space? But we we have those solutions. Yeah. Right? I mean, we the just, cradle we just don't... to grave solutions that community action provides, there is a continuity of care. So continuity of care is a healthcare term that you all should be using every single day. Um, you, you use two generation. Healthcare does not use two generation, right? But it's the exact same thing. <laughs> it is the exact same thing. Um, so you use family development. They use whole person and whole family care, right? And right. so it's not that you've got to change the way that you've done things. It's just know your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Know what the audience, what their terminology is, and be okay with translating, not changing, but translating. It's like if you were to go overseas to Spain and you want to order a beer, you're going to have to probably order it in Spanish, right? You're not going to be able Cerveza. to say, I want a beer, right? <laughs> so, yes. You know that one. I know that those one. Those of us that decide that we travel and we like a cocktail, we learn that word, right? So if we want to do two generation programming, we need to translate that for the healthcare system into whole family, whole person care and continuity of care across generations. Yeah. See, I learn something every time I talk to you. All right, Amanda, yes. get us back on script. So getting us back on script, I want to go back to two things that you said, Karen. One thing about the time frame that we have to be bold and cap, we're being a little bold with the PA Navigate project that you refer to. So Beck, uh, can you give our listeners a little overview of our recent announcement? Absolutely. Bold, I, being bold again. Yes, absolutely. So we're really happy to be able to share that we're the community engagement partner for the PA Navigate project, which you can read more about on our website on the news section. Uh, the press release is shared there. So if you haven't seen it, please take a chance to, to go there. But ultimately, PA Navigate is a statewide community information network designed to address health and social care needs for Pennsylvanians by connecting them to community services. So to put a finer end point on that, it means that healthcare will be able to provide a referral, <clears throat> excuse me, back to the community-based organizations, nonprofits, right? Some of which are community action agencies and other health-related social needs serving organizations to connect them to services in a seamless referral-based way. It also gives our CBO network, right? Community action included, a, a way to also communicate back to the health system. And at the same time, general public, right, who are seeking services can also go on to PA Navigate and find services. But we're really happy to be the partner in this space that helps to 
educate other CBOs, help them understand the importance of this topic. It's why we're doing a podcast on it, right? To help people understand how this translates over. But we're just started in that work the last few months here and very soon going to start to reach out to our, our CBO network. If you are listening and you want to know how to get connected to that work, you can email us at panavigate at thecap.org. Again, panavigate at the cap. And again, read a little bit more on our, our news section of our website and stay tuned because we'll be reaching out to you. So I think we could all, so we're going to bring it back to our closing segment of questions from the community. And I, we still are lacking some questions from the community. So please get your questions into us by emailing us at info at the or just grab a cap staff member on any of the cohort calls or any of our upcoming network calls or events. We love all your questions. So I have some questions. One, we're going to start with you, Karin, and then Beck, I'll have uh, the same question is in this space of SDOH and MCO partnerships, what myths are you busting about community action? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I feel like um, that's one of the ways that I got a lot of momentum um, in my early days of working inside of the healthcare system um, was talking about, oh gosh, let's not reinvent the wheel here. There's hundreds of community-based organizations that are already doing this work. How can we take the structure, particularly in managed care, of building networks like we do with our hospital and health provider systems, how can we build a social care network and, and allow them to do the work they're already doing, right? And so started those conversations very, very early on um, when I started um, working for a managed care company. And it was really interesting to see um, how that kind of took off, right? Is um, and then, you know, that was five years prior to the pandemic and then the pandemic happening. And as we said earlier in this segment, it is the local community-based organizations that ended up being the service delivery providers of both social care and health care um, because the hospitals were overrun. Um, and so routine types of things and vaccinations and all of that had to be done in a different type of location. And so I think that the, the biggest myth to bust um, around uh, one, Beck already said it is, this isn't, should not be adding hardly anything to the social care, social organization or community action agency's plate. It is about reframing what you have been doing for decades for low income and minority families into what are the things that healthcare is now being required to do, and they're not being required to do it themselves. They're being required to show it's getting done. And I think that's important because um, there could be, social service could think that a managed care or large hospital system is, is doing all of their x-ray work or doing all of their pharmacy work, right? No, they may have a small pharmacy, but they're also brokering those services out through partnerships. So hardly any of this work, even on the healthcare side, gets done by one entity. It all gets done through network contracts, through data exchange. Why? Because we as consumers and patients should have choice in where we get our care. We should, we should not be beholden to only going to one pharmacy or only going to one hospital. And so those networks that have been built on the physical health side already exist on the social care side, and we've been a part of them for a long time. It's just how do we broker across different language, different metrics, different funding streams, different data points? That's the hard work of building that infrastructure. And PA Navigate's a big part of that. I'm super excited for, um, for CAP and for all of the local community action agencies. Um, you know, the, this notion of a community care hub um, is rapidly gaining traction across the country. Um, I'm on my second federal review board for federal applications for funding to set up community care hubs. Um, and you guys are very well positioned um, uh, to, to play those roles where your local members decide that they want to step into that space. Beautiful. That is, I mean, 
it's all about what we've been working with with Clearlink, utilizing, bringing resources to our members like our value proposition to try and bridge that gap. And I think to both of your point, a lot of it is around just reframing, which is why we'll be launching a course that you helped develop, Karen, in social determinants of health and bridging some of those things just from you know, how we speak about it. And that'll be launching in Kaplan this summer. So Beck, I'm going to ask you from your perspective, what myths are you busting around social determinants of health in what people know about community action? Yeah, I mean, we've already kind of touched on this, right? It's this idea that we've been we've been doing this for so long. And I think we're, our infrastructure is built to address the concerns that healthcare is trying to find solutions for and, and don't know how to find solutions for, right? Because of the 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 requirement of doing community health community needs assessments, there's a direct correlation immediately. Right. It's it's just it's that simple. And if you haven't seen our video that we cut this past year, you know, Jen Wintermeyer, the executive director of one of our local agencies, uh, Megan Shreve, another amazing executive director of Vanessa Filbert, they all talk about this in their in their interviews that are in that video about why agencies are so different from one county to the next, even within one county, how they're different. And it's specifically to address these things, right? Because I know where I live and I just, we just, um, just put an article out on LinkedIn about this topic. I know that seven miles down the road, you know, my Latino male counterpart is living 15 years less, less than me. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, immediately again, when it's 15 as I met, years, right. That's a parents. Lot, a lot. Think about losing 15 years with your right. family, with your child, with your partner, that's, we're, it's a huge gap. It's a right. huge gap. And so well, when and we... on the flip side of that, it's a, it's a huge e economic and productivity gap as well. Absolutely. Um, right. And so outside of, if we, for those of you that don't like to only look at the, the personal, it, it's a big issue for communities, uh, for workforce development and for our economy when certain parts of our population have that big of a span of mortality rates. Right. Absolutely. And and I think a lot of times our work within community action is is politicized, right? We're we're seen as a welfare program, right? And yes, we provide the connections for people to better understand the services that are available to them. We're also helping them to become less reliant on those systems, right? And when we partner with healthcare, guess what? We reduce the cost of healthcare, and you can see this in other countries throughout the world, right? That this happens. So I'm not just saying this without truth to be told. Um, we, we've heard this over and over again. When healthcare partners with social services, right, we know that the cost of healthcare comes down, and people live longer and healthier and happier lives. It's that simple. Well, and in the the handful of local agencies in Pennsylvania that have the value based contracts with the health plans they're actually earning back percentages of that reduction um, in financial tangible dollars and pennies um, back. Um, and it's, they're not small dollars. Like there, there's some significant funding that has been brokered through the value-based contracts. And while they started in the maternal health realm, the 1115 waiver uh, approval is going to create other opportunities for value-based contracting between the managed care plans and uh, community-based organizations. Because as you'll read in the value proposition, there are five primary SDOH areas that are included in that 1115 waiver. And as we've already talked about, the plans don't do these programs now. They need community partners in order to meet those new requirements. Absolutely. And so in a world of nonprofit, right, where and CBOs, where we are always struggling to try to make sure we have enough funds, we have enough money to keep our programming running. This is one of those opportunities, everybody. If you're a CBO, right, particularly community action agency, and you haven't started to, to think about this, this is a huge opportunity for you. So we are regularly talking about this, please right, ask questions, send them in to the podcast, send them into our cohort calls. We want to make sure to help establish these types of relationships. It's part of why we contracted with Clearly Partners this past year, and we're so thankful for their work that they did with us. And again, I, I just want to say thank you again to Karin for, for joining us this afternoon. It's been Absolutely. a great conversation as always. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. And um, looking forward uh, to um, ongoing conversations um, and seeing how PA Navigate um, unfolds for you all this next couple of months. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll have some follow-up conversations on a future podcast if I am not mistaken about this topic too. I, so. I think this is a topic we'll continue to talk about. And just to put a reference to some of those resources, if you, for our listeners, if you're curious about some of those total state impact numbers, those are in the CAP impact report that are available on our homepage. And we'll link all these in the show notes, including the Healthy People 2030 and some of the tools and resources provided by CAP and other partners that can help you really start thinking about how to not add new programming, reframe, and talk about your programming in a different way that can create better partnerships really uh, and huge impacts on our community so thank you beck thank you karen thank you to all your these listeners that i can't believe people want to listen to us and if you have any questions email us info at the cap thank you thinking cap Thanks, out thinking cap episode two out thank you for being a part of this episode of the thinking cap check the show notes for resources and links to other episodes and don't forget to subscribe and follow to be notified when new episodes are released. If you have any community action questions you'd like Beck, Amanda, or one of our local experts to answer in a future episode, please email your questions about community action to info at thecap.org. Subject line, Thinking Cap.